And no, I'm not going to wear this mask through the entire ceremony. Uh, I've put it on now to just show our good intentions and our, uh, our resolve to comply with social distancing rules. Uh, uh, it, it's an interesting experience to be here at Northgate Hall, uh, surrounded by masked people. It gives a certain sinister cast to the whole undertaking, which may be appropriate. So welcome, welcome to this luminous event on a radiant Berkeley morning, although you'll have to take my word for that. Uh, I take some comfort in the fact that uh, nobody will get sunstroke this morning and nobody will be drenched in a rainfall as we had last year. Um, I'm Ed Wasserman, Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, this is a commencement for the class of 2020. Uh, it's coming to you from the Logan Multimedia Center in Northgate Hall, the University of California, Berkeley, on the northern edge of campus. Um, uh, we'll, we'll be hearing about our students at some length. Uh, that's as it should be, it's their moment. Uh, but I wanna start by saluting the people who put this together, this virtual commencement. Uh, it was not an easy task. There are 11 people I'm going to mention. I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, we uh, had hitches up to the very last minute, uh, starting uh, concluding yesterday when YouTube kicked us off. Uh, we were hoping to stream on YouTube. Uh, but they decided, uh, they found that they had an algorithm that detected some copyright violations, whatever. Uh, I think it's an auspicious thing to start our commencement by declaring that we were too hot for YouTube. Uh, and that is when we're graduating a class of insurgents, I think that is exactly the kind of message we want. But let me salute the people who put together this virtual commencement. It was a very time-consuming job. There's a lot of technical complexity to it. These are things we did not know how to do. We invented on the fly. So let me mention uh, Tracy Pascadi, Jeremy Rue, Michelle Kerr, Rick Johnson, Chris O'Day, Topher Ralph, Marlena Telvik, Chuck Harris, Mark Ingalls, Julie Hirano, and Mickey Capper. So thank you. Thank you all very much for the time and effort that went into that. Uh, to continue with the credits of, to recognize an even more egregiously under-recognized group, which is the parents. And I'm hoping that many of, many of the parents of the students who are graduating today are with us now. Uh, normally, we, are the faculty and staff, uh, we look forward to meeting the parents. Uh, meeting them is always, always puts the students in context. Uh, in, in some cases, meeting the parents solves mysteries. Uh, other cases, it deepens them. Uh, but it's always a great pleasure. So either way, to the parents, I say congratulations. Uh, I can confirm what you suspect. Your student's success is indeed mainly your doing. Um, what I would also caution you is that the, um, I, I, I would caution you that you want to be nice to these students. And it's not just because they're brilliant and accomplished. Uh, it's because that one day, applying the very same expressive skills they've burnished here, they're going to write their memoirs, uh, and they will re-edit their home movies. So it's in your best interest to stay on their good side. Um, now, finally, I want to salute the teachers uh, to, to praise their commitment and their dedication, the hours they put in to train and nurture, the immense satisfaction they take in the student's success. Uh, and I also want to add a special word of praise for the extraordinary, unprecedented collaboration with the New York Times that our faculty has led since the ceiling fell in on all of us two months ago. That collaboration has enabled many of our students, at one point we had 80, to respond to this historic crisis not by cowering in place, but by producing high impact reporting in partnership with the Times and a handful of other news organizations. Uh, congratulations to David Barstow and Gita Anand, who lead our investigative reporting program, and the dozen and a half other faculty who constituted the editorial leadership for this dazzling initiative that's put better than 30 stories, either byline or contributing credits from our students in the New York Times, with another two dozen stories still awaiting work on the editorial pipeline. So I say congratulations and bravo to our graduating class, their parents, and their instructors. And I say to all of you, savor this moment. It's a weird one. It's weird like putting on a suit and putting on a tie to speak to an empty hall. 
but still in all, you don't get many like it. Life offers very few such moments where you're invited to take pleasure in achievements of comparable stature and to revel in the immense promise that we salute here. This ceremony may be virtual, but there's nothing virtual about the degrees these students have earned. They are real, and that has not changed. Of course, a lot of other things have, as you, the class of 2020, know well. When people a generation or two older than you ask about my impressions of your generation, I talk about the sense of imperilment, of vulnerability. I talk about determination and principle, about how old you were when 9-11 happened, when the financial system melted down in 2008, when the wheels came off the wagon for many of us in 2016. And now I'd have to add this terrifying pandemic and the resulting collapse or, or tottering nature of our economic system. Naturally, you're worried. You're entering a profession whose business basics are, to put it charitably, in disarray. You aspire to serve a public that is encouraged to distrust your capacities and your motives. The future doesn't exactly beckon. But you know, don't kid yourself. Things weren't so great in my day either. I spent my 20s overseas because out of dismay and disgust with my country. And when I came back, by the time I came back, I had two years of reporting experience, degrees from three of the world's greatest universities, and a deep yearning to be a journalist. I was also 30, and the best I could find was a $14,000 a year job doing business reporting in Casper, Wyoming. And we had one kid with another one born in my first year there. And it was hard. But then journalism has never been the option of the shrewd and career-minded. So what I want to say right now may surprise you, but I envy you. I honestly do. I change places with you in a heartbeat, not just because you're young, although that matters, not just because you're humane and caring and immensely talented. I envy you because of the very shambles you've inherited, because you have an opportunity to matter. Your skills, your consciousness, your principles, your determination, your humanity, rarely has the world needed them so desperately as it does now. It won't be easy, it never was. We know, we tried. I got my first news job in the early 70s in the shadow of Watergate. We thought we were winning. Racial equality, gender rights, ending a murderous war, chasing a crooked president from office, social justice, imagining a different, better world. We thought we had the wind to our backs. We thought we were winning just as you now fear that you're losing, but we weren't and you're not either. History is too elusive, too indecipherable, too unknowable. None of us can see around corners. In this scary moment, we don't know what transformative possibilities are gathering force. Sure, these could turn out to be the good old days. You may look back with fondness and the clarity, the camaraderie of this moment, or things could get way better. Because none of us can know about the possibilities of repair, of redemption, of social reinvention that this infection may unleash. It's not sure that the future belongs to those who hate, that it'll be some survivalist fantasy of anger and strife. We're also seeing the stirrings of a people awakening to interdependence, to the possibility of a society that's kinder and more caring, that not only talks principles of justice and humanity, but lives them. This could well become that moment, your moment, and that I wish on you. Meantime, to the class of 20, we at the Berkeley Journalism, we pledge to continue making this school a better, smarter, more influential part of the national and indeed world media landscape. I share with you an insight from an old friend of mine, Hotting Carter III, a former newspaper publisher whose family owned paper in Greenville, Mississippi, bucked the heritage of Southern press and battled Jim Crow. He became a filmmaker, a US diplomat, an academic, a transformative head of the Knight Foundation. Now he's nearing the end of his life, who recently said, this is an explosively creative time to be in journalism if you are not in search of the past. 
Well, we are not. We'll continue to try to imagine the future. We will continue to do everything we can to make sure the degree you receive today will continue to gain in value, will testify to your talents more powerfully with each passing year, and will enable you to continue to benefit from the network of creative collaborators you both leave behind here and head out alongside. You should carry on as you have here, watch each other's backs, offer counsel and wisdom, make sure as you rise, so do they. They're your sisters and brothers. Together, you're the chroniclers, the tellers of the tales, the keepers of the conscience and the collective memory, the ones who bear witness. When attention must be paid, you pay it. A hundred years from now, heaven willing, when the stories that resonate and inspire are told around the campfires of the future, they will be your stories. You have work to do. Make us proud. I know you will. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Nisha Balaram, the first student speaker. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nisha Balaram, and I'm on the documentary film track. Thank you for having me. And on behalf of the class of 2020, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone attending the ceremony. Now, when I first learned that I had the opportunity to speak and found out that it was going to be on Zoom, my first reaction was a little bit of gratitude. While I miss Northgate, if I were to be perfectly honest, I wasn't sure how to make the transition from sweatpants if we had to meet in person. And my second reaction was one of being overwhelmed. My class is composed of individuals with a wide range of accomplishments. So how would I be able to capture all of the extraordinary things that they've done over the past two years? Today, as Dean Ed Wasserman said, is a special day because in the midst of uncertainty, we've come together to celebrate, but we haven't come here alone. We've come with friends and family, uh, people who have heard us complain about late hours, helped us lug heavy gear, and supported us as we walk through the world of journalism, both a rewarding and increasingly complex profession. Put simply, my colleagues are fearless and driven, traveling to every corner of the globe and involved in every activity that you could think of, from the COVID-19 collaboration with the New York Times to working outside of our school curriculum as writers, editors, and producers on long-form narrative projects podcasts, and the occasional documentary series, to name a few. In the meantime, my classmates have developed a community in which we critically look at the future of journalism and wonder, what is our role to change it? But what does that look like day to day? Since I can only speak from my own experiences, I'll know what I personally love about my class. First, my class has an acute awareness of our capacity to change the narratives that we tell and the people we portray. Over the course of these two years, my colleagues have brought up the necessity of not only representing life experiences and perspectives from a diversity of points of view, but also stories that span the categories of race, gender, geographical region, and so on. They've also centered themselves as being responsible for acknowledging and tackling racial inequities while thinking creatively on how to change power dynamics in the journalism field. This is exactly in line with UC Berkeley's vision of our program, which states, at their best, Journalists hold those in power accountable, incubate principled reform, and stir emotions that lead to meaningful change. Second, this class is an insane work ethic, but put simply, some of you are at the journalism school 24 seven. And third, there's a real sense of collaboration and community here at Northgate. Despite everyone's busy schedule, I've seen and have personally benefited, benefited from others always being willing to pitch in on others' projects, offering additional chances for feedback and maintaining a sincerity to see each other win. I remember when I first learned about my admission to this school, I was excited about having the opportunity to work with world-renowned faculty and they did not disappoint. They embraced our roles as mentors, not only teaching us, but inspiring us with their own work. Passing along their skill set, as well as motivating us to think big and embracing our own voice. They especially instilled in us the importance of our role, even in the midst of an attack on free speech or a pandemic. Uh -huh. Now, as I've learned in one of my documentary classes, one of the tools, one of the tools that one can use in storytelling to convey a possibly complex idea is to find the poem in the room. When I think about our next steps post-graduation, my poem in the room is the story of the broccoli tree. I learned about this story from the author, John Green. So 
what is the broccoli tree? The, this, the broccoli tree is a tree on the southern shore of Lake Return in Sweden. Long used as shade during hot days by the water, photographer Patrick Svedberg always notices it on his daily commute. The single tree, reminiscent of a stalk of broccoli, always brings a smile to his face. And one day, this photographer decides to take a picture of this tree and put it on his personal Instagram profile. Over time, the photos that he takes are daily, all different. While the tree is a focal point, it's more about what's around the tree that says more about the life around it. A bird flying, people picnicking under its branches, a couple posing for wedding photographs. And after a while, the tree gains notoriety. As people pay more attention, the photographer uploads at least a couple photos each week. And eventually, it gets its own social media handle on Instagram, called, you guessed it, the broccoli tree. As what happens with journalists delving into a single topic to the point of obsession, the tree becomes the focus or beat of everything that Patrick does. The photographer has now cultivated a creative life around the broccoli tree. One summer, he prints out photos of the broccoli tree and has it staged at the broccoli tree itself. And the photographer over time has honed his skills through this project. There's a calendar now, and people flock to the tree as a tourist destination. One time, he even photographs the broccoli tree while people are photographing people in front of the broccoli tree. And then one morning, Patrick arrives to photograph and something has changed. The tree's trunk has been cut in such a way that the tree won't be able to survive. And just like that, the next day, the broccoli tree is gone. As John Green puts it, you love something, you shared it, many people loved it too, and then one or a few people decided to cut it down. I came across this story by chance, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized how it is a perfect analogy for who we are in this department and the vulnerability and tension that exist in our day-to-day -day lives as graduates of journalism. Through sharing, things belong less to us and more to the world, and that always comes with a risk. In our role as journalists, we develop intimate connections with sources. We debate on what to share and not to share, keeping in mind that our gaze can have real consequences with, with results sometimes beyond our power. Would the tree have been cut down, I wonder, if it was never photographed? Would it still be on the shores of Lake Return? As with the broccoli tree, journalists have the skills as storytellers to add layers of meaning to what could be seen as small moments, because it is usually the smallest detail that can have an immense capacity for beauty, revealing a larger truth about ourselves and the world around us. As with this tree, journalism is also where we bring our own personal selves to what we cover, the photographer in this case, as well as the community he cultivated, mourned the loss of this tree. But it is not a lesson that news shouldn't be shared at risk of going viral. Instead, this shows us how mindful we should be of our profession, where we sometimes have to weigh moral decisions of what is right and wrong, how to portray others, and what our gaze on a given topic could lead to. All topics that have been addressed during our time at graduate school, in which my colleagues have actively taken on. From bringing up issues of equity, addressing who is telling the narrative and for what purpose, and to carefully and seriously considering our role as people, not just as journalists. <laughs> um, as, sorry, as a concluding thought, my colleagues' capacity for resilience is immense, and I am confident that they will go out into the world um, and not only survive, but thrive in their various professions, all the while connecting others to issues that are important and like the broccoli tree, bringing bits of joy to everyday life. I wanna say thank you to the Graduate School of Journalism, including the staff and faculty, as well as a network of alumni who have supported us along the way. And I wanna extend a big thank you to my classmates of being examples of who I want to be in the world. Lastly, I wish to thank my family and friends for, for providing me the support to get to this point. Best of luck, class of 2020. I'm so proud of us and I'll see you on Zoom. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Meg. Um, I want to invite anyone on Zoom to keep yourselves unmuted in case you want to laugh or clap or boo. <laughs> Any kind of yeah. reaction. Yeah. Go Meg. Thank you. We love you, Meg. Go Meg. Thank you. So some of us are gathered today in Berkeley, and many of us have spent the last two years or more here. Here, 
on the occupied territory of the Ohlone people who have stewarded this land for generations. Hearing a little feedback, so maybe you should mute yourselves. <laughs> um, but I wanted to begin by acknowledging this history and our role as colonizers, even as we come together today to celebrate our hard work and achievement at the J School. Every story has history, including ours. Take my classmate Ricky, for example. Growing up, both of Ricky's parents were in school. He remembers, go Ricky, he remembers being about nine years old and tagging along with his mom to night classes. And she was working towards her master's at the time in child development. But finances and other circumstances made it impossible for her to finish. And today, Ricky is the first person in his family to get a master's degree. And he shared with me how much that means to him, and how much it meant to his parents, how much she wanted it, how much she worked towards it, and now what it means to him. And that's true for several of my classmates today who are first in their families. I thought it was really important to share this today because for some of us, the road to graduation has been paved and others are forging new ground. So while we can't all stand and acknowledge you, all of you first, um, I wanted to list you all by name, those of you who have shared with me that this is true for you. Jennifer Cortez, Pedro Cota, Eric Murphy, Darren Sieno, Maria Sestito, Casey Smith, James Tenswan, and Ricky Roda. Congratulations to each of you and the entire class of 2020. It is a huge honor to be representing you all today. You inspire the hell out of me. You are smart, talented, and many of you seem to be guided by some kind of internal moral compass that is showing the way for all of us. I have learned so much from being in your midst for the last two years. I'm grateful for you and so proud of what we have all accomplished. To be fair, we couldn't have gotten, gotten here without a lot of help. Our families made sacrifices, they stood by us through that J200 grind, and they've been patient with the concept that news doesn't stop for holidays. The staff at this school have gone above and beyond to make Northgate a home and the J School a family. Our professors have not only taught us how to write, how to shoot, how to disguise an alcoholic beverage during Zoom class, They've given up nights and weekends and who knows what else to coax and nurture and sometimes rewrite our stories into existence. So as we head into the biggest recession since the Great Depression, I wanna give an extra shout out to the How to Be a Freelancer mini class because we're all gonna need that. All right, I just wanna take this opportunity to say a few words directly to the J School administration on behalf of the class of 2020. Three words actually, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> sorry, because I know we have been difficult. Our class has been rude. We've been disrespectful. We've made demands. We've rejected your curriculum. When you were working really hard to support us and teach us, we told you it simply was not enough. And we didn't even say that nicely. Most of my classmates know what I'm talking about. But we are also not sorry because we know that we've made this school better by speaking up. When we demanded a more diverse curriculum for first year forum, we made you listen because we know that we have a lot to learn from the Pulitzer Prize winning Ida B. Wells and others, W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida Tarbell, Lucy Wilmot Smith, just to name a few. When we experienced racism and sexism at the investigative reporting program, we would not stand for it because we know the world needs more women and queer folks and people of color to be doing investigative reporting. When we told you how the school was letting down students of color, we wished we didn't have to explain it, but many of my classmates did. They put in a huge amount of labor to educate the school, even when we've been paying for the school to educate us, because we know that traditional journalism doesn't treat all of us equally. It privileges whiteness and maleness and a certain kind of education. But there will be brilliant students next year and the year after who have different backgrounds and so much to offer. So we did it for them. 
And remember that time a New York Times reporter came to teach us about reporting on homelessness? And we wouldn't let him live down that one article where he managed to not talk to a single person experiencing homelessness. Yeah, we were rude. But we were just trying to teach him because we know that our job isn't to speak for the voiceless. That's just a saying that diminishes the humanity of marginalized people. Our job isn't to speak for anyone. It's to listen, often to folks that others aren't hearing. If we are going to be journalists, if we are going to write for outlets like the New York Times and shout out to my classmates who have been doing it, you guys are amazing. We can't make those mistakes. But guess what? That first year forum looked different this year. The investigative reporting program looks different too. I'm even told that the Dean read the book White Fragility over the summer and many of us took an unconscious bias training that students organized and the school paid for. That New York Times guy though, he is still writing about homelessness. So let's not have changed that. My point is though, that even if every class thinks that they are amazing and they are the best, they are leaving a mark, our class actually is. Now, I'm one of the older students in my class. I'm pretty squarely millennial, but I think some of our class's identity um, can be attributed to the Gen Z among us. They're known for being independent, self-confident, and if they aren't known for being a little entitled, they probably should be. But it's, it's definitely more than a generational thing that makes our class special. I was gonna make a dig at the first years, but I'm gonna hold back. I am <laughs> incredibly proud of my classmates for the work that they do, and even more proud of the people that they are. We need them. In a world where the privileged can shelter in place while poor people must put their lives on the line to work, a world where black men can't go jogging outside, where families are separated, where some people don't have a home while others have many homes. We need stories to connect us and to change us. From what I've seen in the last two years, my class is already doing that. And it doesn't stop here. The result of our class being fierce and at times insufferable is going to have an impact on future classes here at Berkeley, who will go on to have an impact on newsrooms and the media, which will go on to make more history and change the world. So I guess what I'm really saying is you're welcome. Our work here is done. Thank you. People are loving you, Meg. Hi, everyone. Hi. Okay, I'm coming hi. in. Hi. 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 I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go with Meg and say, feel free to um, unmute. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Cassandra Herman, and I'm so honored to be here today, live and beaming into your living rooms. Um, because we're on Zoom, I wanted to suggest some snack pairings for my speech. Um, anything bubbly would be fabulous. Um, and then I'm going to recommend potato chips because they're really tasty and the crunching sound will help drown out the parts where I'm flailing. Um, okay, here we go. Um, though we're each joining today separately and via technology, all of us are connected by one place, Northgate Hall. Some of us have been there over decades, others like you for the past two years of your life. Today is a momentous day. And I know that it's really hard that you can't be there together in person to celebrate it. If we were together, we would be in the courtyard where we've all talked, laughed, marked milestones, had meltdowns, eaten one too many falafels, and grabbed some air after sweating in the hot box hallways and freezing in the TV lab. The courtyard beautifully centers the school and also beautifully holds space for our collective memory. In my memories, the courtyard was where I had my very first conversations 20 years ago with a group of women who had become some of my closest friends. Many of you, I'm sure, will someday look back and remember a similar time. So I wanna acknowledge the place that we were all looking so forward to being in today. I wanna to take a moment and ask everyone to close their eyes and imagine themselves there, surrounded by all of us together. 
just whatever images, sounds, or memories it brings for you. So that feeling is something that can't be ever taken away. We're connected by place, but we're also connected by something that we each learned to do so well at the J School, which is to tell stories. I'm always harping on my students about the difference between subject and story. The subject today is commencement. The story, to quote Adrian Rich, is of moments when even slow motion moved too fast for the shutter of the camera. Learning how to tell stories at the J School changed the course of my life. It transformed a passion into a purpose. That purpose is the foundation of the storytelling we all do as journalists. Our stories give meaning to facts and figures. They have power and they have reach. They can be evocative, provocative, engaging, and enraging. They can bind people together and break them apart. And stories, as Joan Didion said, are what we tell ourselves in order to live. They help us find meaning in life. In my story, the story of this place helped me do just that. In my life, the story of this place helped me do just that. Not long before I applied to the J School, my father, who I was very close to, died unexpectedly. I was devastated and I was lost. I'd been floating through my life, living overseas, not focused on building a real career. Then I told myself a story that going back to school, getting a master's degree, would make it all okay. I'd have stability, and even though my dad would never see the payoff from all of his unconditional belief in me, I would still find a way to make him proud. So I came, I found a community, and I found the courage to embrace my calling. We all tell ourselves stories in order to live, and I think that how stories are crafted, how we've learned to tell them can help us live better, work better, and be more resilient and adaptive. In all good storytelling, from myth to Shakespeare to Killing Eve, sorry, I had to get it in there somehow, um, there is a protagonist and a goal. And as the protagonist moves toward her goal, an obstacle appears, and then another. In my story, I was in another country, and a phone call came in the middle of the night about my father. See, now you're interested. You want to find out what happens next. What will she do? In life, as in storytelling, obstacles are gifts. When our plans are interrupted, when things fall apart, we have to make choices. And in those moments, we have agency, we make bold decisions, and we take risks, like coming to this school. And we are truly the creators of our lives and our futures. And each challenge helps us better adapt to the unpredictability of life. So the plot in any good story has obstacles, choice, and action. Right now, as you prepare to leave school and head into the working world, you have a big obstacle, a global pandemic. But it can also be a gift, and you have a choice. And you're not alone. You are all part of a long lineage of storytellers, stretching through time and across every culture who have grappled with big change. The ancient Greeks carved their unfolding history into walls. You're capturing it with cameras and sound and in print. So let's time travel for a minute and get some perspective from your early forebears in storytelling. When in Zoom. Okay, let's see. Is that working? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, it's working. Thank you, Angelica. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too. Okay, so here we go. Very first slide. This is the leap of faith. This is the very first choice. Okay, get one here. J200, everyone heading out to cover the very same thing. But imagine <laughs> if you had to do this on a moose or whatever that is. Okay, so here we've got everyone at the prehistoric Berkeley City Council meeting, which is a nightmare in any time period. This is one of the earliest recorded attempts to set up a tripod. <laughs> <laughs> so here you wanna look at how much easier you have it. And there's the poor guy on the left, probably Christian with his little bag pack of XLR cables. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> hey, here's Rick in the cave, cursing while trying to remove grape leaves stuck to a microphone. Oh my god, go ahead. 
Okay. Showcase. Here we go. The first showcase. <laughs> I mean, I know that you guys had like really tight turnarounds and stuff, but imagine this, like the acoustics, there's no headroom, you've got like limited guests, and then you've got competing work on every wall around you. So um. it, could, it could be, it could be worse. Okay. Okay, this is Mickey Catoni and Max Brimelow's seminal coyote piece for J283. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Impre Woo! Impressive piece of work here. Um, second year, the legendary Chris O'Day teaching picture and sound hunting. <laughs> and this is, um, this was, I just want to say this was approved by Jim Wheaton as a fair use piece. So I'll save here. Okay, now we have Mickey Catoni's later work. Um, this is where he, he cleverly manages to hieroglyph his narration and just really takes it to the next level. Um, here, aha, yes, this, this is the age-old kitchen battle over limited forks. The people on the left have them and the people on the right want them. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. oh, okay, record scratch. So reality sets in. And not reality sits in, sorry, the record scratch is COVID-19 and we have to shelter in place. So this was the moment that interrupted everything. Ooh. And we have to move to <laughs> Zoom classes. <laughs> so it's the new, the new normal. And this, this is our very first doc <laughs> Zoom class. People are straggling in and everyone is wearing the same pajamas. <laughs> okay, this. Is reality really setting in? Oh. <laughs> and we've got the doc students, home alone editing, start losing your mind. <laughs> okay, then, 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 wait, hope, hope arrives. Hope arrives in the name of the New York Times COVID project. <laughs> There's David and Gita. Gita, I'm so sorry that history does such a disservice here to your role. <laughs> Finally, the class of 2020 makes it through and commencement. You bring your dog in an offering bowl and you get a diploma. <laughs> so, now I'm going to um, skip forward in time to my commencement. Oh. Oh. So this, this was the, the uh, culmination of one of the best choices that I ever made. Um, there's, I'm getting my diploma there from Joan Beter. And Kelly Whalen is coming up next. Um, and this right behind me. And this week, Kelly and I will cross over the finish line with our class of amazing, talented documentary filmmakers. And that is a plot point in my life that I never would have imagined and that I would not have traded for anything. Um, and that all started with an obstacle. And finally, there you all are at the beginning of your journey to this moment. So think back to that first choice that you made and how far you've come. All the hard moments and messy obstacles of the past two years and the incredible gift of what you've achieved. I'm imagining all the stories that begin today with each of you as you leave here and make difficult daring choices that will complicate your life and your work in beautiful ways. And I cannot wait to hear them. You will be so greatly missed, but always here. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra, for reminding Thanks, us all Cassandra. about the power of story. I also want to thank Cassandra for naming my Zoom space between two orchids. I think I'm going to keep that one. <laughs> so uh, now I'm going to tell a story. It begins with me, it ends with you, and it's about all of us. And first, I'd like to say that I'm grateful to the short form shorties for teaching me the value. Short form. The, yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah. Uh, cheers. The, the value in being vulnerable, which is especially important in these times. Aww. In some of my earliest memories, I can't breathe. It's not one memory, 
but several. Always at night, there's a car ride, a hospital, oxygen, some sort of medicine, and the reassuring face of my mother. And I wonder now how she could have been so calm and yet worried enough to take her baby boy to the emergency room because he could not breathe. I learned to control my asthma, but sometimes the most inconsequential things like fresh cut grass or a bouquet of flowers can trigger a reaction in my body, a constriction and an instant anxiety. When the fires came last year and my N95s were not, not enough and my air filters were not enough, I finally had to leave the Bay Area altogether. It was that or back to the emergency room. I've lived my life knowing that one day it would be my lungs that would fail me first. And I've imagined myself, hopefully late into my 80s, suffering from some respiratory illness and struggling for the last time. These days when I read the news, I avoid the accounts of all those who have perished hooked up to respirators. It just feels too personal, impossible. Not long ago, my wife and I were staring at the ceiling, taking stock of our pandemic lives. She said she didn't think this virus was for her. In her bones, she knew she would be all right. And I agreed, she is gonna be fine. But I told her I didn't feel the same about me. It feels like this one may have my number. Most of us either know someone very close to us or are ourselves high risk. And it is likely that before this is all over, we will all have to confront this virus with our own bodies and let fate take over. This realization, this acceptance that 14 days from any day could be my last, compelled me to take a lot of walks in the woods. Sometimes it was in the lingering fog which carried the scent of pine and bay mixed with moist earth. Often it was after twilight, alone with the owls in the dark, feeling afraid and feeling alive. At home, I have savored each interaction with my family, each moment cooking, every laugh and embrace, grateful to be here now. If this is it, make sure it is worth it. And these past months, when I would wake up in the morning, I would log on to see the faces of my team, Lulu, Brandon, Nick, Molly, Rosa, and I knew I was in the right place. I told them, as I tell you all now, it is you who inspire me and give meaning to this journey. We're all gonna die someday, and I'm honored and thankful to be working alongside you now. The determination that you have all shown, the desire to keep moving forward, and the dedication to our craft gives me faith that this vocation is worth dedicating a life to. Now, I had a graduation in the sun, and I wore this shirt, which I had made for the occasion, with a matching one for my son. See, see there's a picture. And there's my son and my lovely wife. Oh, so sweet. You know, during the school year, I have the same three shirts I wear every uh, week, and now I'm recycling my graduation gear as well. That day was a celebration in the purest sense. The speaker, however, was not. The dean had invited the wife of Daniel Pearl, a journalist who had been brutally and publicly murdered. Her talk threw cold water on our faces, reminding us that we were living in serious times and that we needed to be prepared. I never watched the video of his gruesome demise, just like I never truly confronted the fact that this profession could mean risking my own life. Now we are all at risk and none of us need reminding, this, uh, reminding of the storm clouds around us. But for me, the sunlight in this moment comes from the knowledge that the work we are doing is absolutely necessary and the service we provide is essential. In a very literal sense, it is vital as we tell stories that can potentially save lives. But in some cases, to tell these stories, we have to come out of our shelter and risk our own health and the health of those around us to get to the source. 
While I was not surprised by the eagerness many of, uh, many of you to go out into the world, I was comforted by how seriously you took this endeavor. What I did not expect was how much I would learn from your experiences. On a recent reporting trip, Christian came to a conclusion that I'm still processing. He was filming with Allison and Mei Ying, telling the story of a vulnerable community of elderly immigrants packed into cramped housing who, against the odds, have been able to hold off the pandemic using education, cooperation, and compassion, truly a model for all of us. While filming, a hospital worker told Chrissy that he too was an essential worker, which puzzled him at first because he had always considered the act of telling stories as a privilege. It is essential and a privilege. They're both true. Because as essential as we are, we are making a choice. And many essential workers do not have that option. Many essential workers are working under duress without the possibility of sick pay, unemployment, or even health care. Many essential workers are being told that if they stay home because they are afraid of getting sick, they will lose their jobs. Or if they talk to the press, if they talk to us, they will be fired. They don't have a choice, but we do. So when we exercise our essential status in this time, it comes with a responsibility beyond your traditional law and ethics. Going out into the world now means not only putting ourselves in harm way, harm's way, it means we could be inadvertently harming others with our mere presence. This puzzle of being at the same time vulnerable and a vector does not have a simple solution. Social distancing, sanitation, and PPE won't solve it completely. And the answer isn't anything you were taught here in school. I certainly don't have the answer. But I know it lies between what we know and what we feel. To report in this world, or to even go to the store or visit our parents, we will need to arm ourselves with the best information we have, and then decide what risks we are willing to take, not just for us, but for our families and our communities, so that we could all breathe easy. So I was looking for the right sports metaphor to wrap this up, some pandemic version of there's two minutes left in the fourth quarter and this is the time to shine, but it didn't feel like that moment. And, um, you know, there's a lot of material to work with in baseball because, you know, anything can happen in baseball, but it, that didn't seem quite right either. And to be honest, this whole pandemia feels more like watching a cricket match. I have no idea what's going on and it seems like it's never gonna end. But the truth is that there's no one metaphor to describe what you all have been dealing with, from housing issues and health concerns, TCs and quarantines, to travel restrictions and visas, all while racing to keep up with the story of the century, making a name for yourself and getting a job. No one has ever done what you all have just accomplished. And instead of giving you words of encouragement or a pep talk, I want to express my awe and gratitude. Thank you for showing us your strength. Thank you for bending and not breaking. Thank you for meeting the challenges of these past months with resolve, imagination, and resilience. Thank you for all that you have done and all that you will do. Best of luck to you all. Thank you, Andres. Um, it's our custom here each year to have the students select the commencement speaker. And this year, I'm proud to welcome to address Berkeley oh, Journalism class yeah. of 2020, Erlon Woods. He's the co-creator, co-producer, and co-host of the Pulitzer Prize finalist podcast, Ear Hustle. Woods' voice first reached listeners' ears in 2017 when Ear Hustle debuted with co-creators Nigel Poor and Antoine Williams. Their podcast tells the stories of life in prison and afterward. Erlon Woods was sentenced to 31 years to life in 1997 for attempted second-degree armed robbery under a three-strikes law. 
In 2016, ear hustle, which is prison slang for eavesdropping, beat over 1,500 rival entries in a competition for new programs held by the podcast network Radiotopia. So Woods, Poor, and Williams began producing episodes from within San Quentin. In 2018, then Governor Jerry Brown commuted Erlon Woods' sentence, writing, he has set a positive example for his peers and through his podcast has shared meaningful stories from those inside prison. So Woods walked free after 21 years and was quickly hired by Public Radio Exchange as a full-time producer. Earlier this month, Woods, along with Poor, who's an artist in San Quentin State Prison volunteer, and Rashan Thomas, an incarcerated journalist, were named finalists in the Pulitzer Prize's inaugural audio reporting category. Today, we join UC Berkeley Chancellor Carol Christ in honoring Erlon Woods with a special Chancellor's citation. She writes in part, with heartfelt admiration for his work to improve himself and the community at large, set a positive example for his peers, and share meaningful stories from those who are incarcerated. By shedding unprecedented light on the lives and struggles of San Quentin's inmates, Woods has put a human face on the consequences of three decades of increased mass incarceration in California. I want to salute Mickey Capper for putting his shoulder to the wheel to, to initiate the honor that we've now Woo! secured for Erlon Woods, well-deserved. And it's great pleasure and uh, for us an honor to present to you Erlon Woods. Hello, Berkeley J School class of 2020. Good looking out to Dean Wasserman for the kind introduction. Thanks to the faculty and the parents who I assume are here. I can't see any of y'all, which is cool, because if I could, I'd probably be sitting here shaking in my pants and scared shitless. <laughs> and most importantly, thanks to Mickey and the rest of the J School student body for inviting me to do this. I was really touched when I heard that the school wanted me to give this year's commencement address. And my first response is what you might expect. Hell to the no. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, the invitation was really moving and it was a real honor. The reason I responded in that way was because this is really not my strong suit. This is not what I do. I mean, I can get up, I can talk about my life experiences, talk about prison, I can talk about ear hustle, talk about my mama, talk about how we should repeal California three strikes law. But when it comes to imparting knowledge about the study of journalism to people that's getting a degree on that, nah. But then Mickey explained that the students actually vote for the commencement speaker. Now, Ear Hustle is sometimes nominated for some prestigious awards, but the one I look out for each year are the ones that are voted on by actual listeners. I always hold my breath for the Webbies. So when I heard this invitation was a result of the people's vote, that was deep. That got me over all my re reservations, or at least most of them. I mean, the chancellor uh, uh, citation is great, but Dean Wasserman, I'm still holding out for that honorary degree. <laughs> but it's still crazy to me that I'm here. Well, it's also crazy that I'm like here, here. Yeah, 2020 is weird, right? I never imagined giving a speech for an event like this, but if I had, I definitely wouldn't have imagined delivering it from an empty studio. <laughs> but I guess this isn't how you pictured your graduation either. On the plus side, as Dean Wasserman mentioned, last year it rained and everybody had to sit out in the courtyard messing with umbrellas and stuff. We're good on that this year. <laughs> but the thing is, you graduating students and everyone involved in the ceremony you figured out a hustle. You figured out a workaround, and that's how we get down in prison, and we call it prison ingenuity. Being able to find a workaround, that's a useful skill in this profession you're getting into. And I know you're already finding those workarounds. You probably didn't come here in the fall of 2018 thinking, I'm going to go to a world-class journalism school and learn how to cover global pandemics. But you're doing it and you're knocking it out the park. 
you've done work about how this pandemic has messed up the way food gets to restaurants and grocery stores and how California farms are responding. Stories about how the people working in those farms can't even afford to buy the food they're growing. I see you, Lulu. You found a school in California that was still open and you worked on these stories with places like KQED, NPR, and excuse me, the New York Times. That's pretty good to do with you. Another thing that's weird about how we're meeting here today, or maybe it's ironic, or maybe it's convenient because it gives me a bit of a theme for the speech, is that on Ear Hustle, we try to do the opposite of social distancing. Social distancing make people look smaller. You can't see emotions behind these masks, voices sound different over Zoom, words get lost, and people appear in these little boxes. Things get even awkward with people that you know well. My co-host, Nigel Poor and I have recorded narrations for something like 40 episodes now, and it's hella fun. But these days, we're connecting over Zoom to do that. And all of a sudden, it's gotten a little awkward. We keep stepping over each other. We don't hear one another or respond in the right way. All of this distancing makes it just a little bit harder to really see people. I think Ear Hustle has always been about helping listeners see people they hadn't really seen before. Don't get me wrong, journalism can be socially distancing. In fact, my first experience with journalism had me squarely on the other side of the equation. I had someone telling their version of my story. This was a news story about the incident that sent me to prison the second time with 31 years to life sentence. That night, three of my friends and I got into a police chase over a failed carjacking. Our car crashed and we took off running. As soon as we started to run, the cops threw 41 shots in our direction. My friend Furman Little was shot five times in the back and died an hour later. I was shot once under my armpit, the bullet exited the middle of my chest. I was in a hospital for close to 24 hours. During that time, I had to call Furman's pregnant wife and tell her what just happened to her husband. I also started to see news reports about the incident. And these stories all said, gunman killed and officer involved shooting. The thing is, I knew Furman didn't even have a gun. There was a gun at the scene, but I had it and it had no bullets in it, and it was nowhere near Furman. A little while later, a journalist came to write more about the incident, and I asked her why the earlier reports described my friend as a gunman, and she said all those reporters got their information from the cops on the scene. On another level, it was just fucked up to see my friend, a guy I knew to be disciplined, cordial, and enterprising, reduced to a quote, gunman. It felt unfair. Calling him that makes shooting him in the back seems justified. And it makes me think about how the words journalists use to describe people can distort, misrepresent, diminish, or lie about a person. When we tell people's story on Ear Hustle, we normally don't get into what it was that put them in prison. For one thing, like Furman, the facts of the case often get twisted, but also, hearing what someone is convicted of can distance. You start to see people only as a bad decision they made. Listeners might not get past that. They might not see the full complicated person who even in a place as undesirable as prison has humor and joy in their life. I read the letters Ear Hustle gets. I follow social media. Listeners are always telling us that we've changed the way they see the 2 million people locked up in America. We've humanized them. I think that simple choice to not always get into the crimes people are accused of is a big part of that. Another part of cutting that distance is, I hate to say it, cursing. I hope my executive producer don't get mad about this. With Ear Hustle, my whole thing was us being us. If we're trying to portray prison experience, you have to show how it really is. In prison, you don't hear, hey, sir, how you doing? You hear, hey, motherfucker, what's happening? I think it's important to not be sanitized, have the freedom to speak in the way we speak, use the language we use, the prison parlance. Hey, sir, how you doing? It's fake. 
It's distancing. Hey, motherfucker, what's happening? Brings you in. So sharing these voices of people who often don't have a voice, bringing listeners closer to those experiences is a big part of what Ear Hustle does, and it's vital. I think it's one of the most important things journalism is doing these days, but I also think it's real complicated. Like, there is this thing I see happening sometimes with formerly incarcerated people. More of us are getting out and sharing our stories, and that's great. It's changing things. But there's a lot of trauma in our stories. The trauma that can lead you to prison and all the traumas that you experience while you're in there. Even though we like to bring the jokes on Ear Hustle, there is trauma in the backgrounds of a lot of our stories. A good friend of mine went through a lot of, her, a lot of stuff in her life. She was sex trafficked, ended up killing her trafficker, and going to prison for 20 years. Since she's been out, she's been asked to share her story a lot at events to educate and advocate. I talked to her after she did these events, and she said it was like she had her scars opened up all over again. When everyone leaves for the night, she's still there patching up her wounds. As journalists, you're talking to a survivor of crime, a victim of crime. Know that you're peeling back layers to get to a story, but that story is somebody's life. When you leave, that person is gonna be hurting. Remember that for yourselves too. You're gonna to cover some heavy stories. In fact, you already have. This coronavirus thing is, world, is a worldwide trauma. Dealing with that all day can take a toll on the people that's telling the stories too. Remember to talk to your colleagues and friends, all these people you're graduating with about what you're seeing and what you're going through. Don't let each other be distant, encourage and uplift one another. That's what dudes do in prison. Sometimes you do it in self-help groups. Sometimes you take that practice to the yard, chopping it up, checking in with one another, like, how you feeling, man? Anything you want to unpack? So yeah, this is hella hard work, and it doesn't get any easier. Before each season of Ear Hustle starts, we always say, this is going to be the season where we have all the episodes done before we lunch, and we never even get close. In fact, I have to go soon because I'm way behind on our next episode. So it's hard, but this work is so important. Journalists, y'all included, are preserving facts about this pandemic among all this fake news about sunlight and Lysol. You need to keep doing that. You need to keep telling people what's happening in prisons and jails and ICE detention centers. Among other things, COVID-19 is running wild in those places right now. You need to keep broadcasting it when cops kill black people and try to call them gunmen. And journalism, it does change things. I said before that my favorite award is the Webby's. But what's most impactful is these letters we get from our listeners. We get a lot of them, people reaching across the distance. I got one on Messenger a few days ago that I want to read to y'all. Says, hi, Erline. I just wanted to tell you and Nigel that your podcast is helping me. My granddaughter is doing seven years in prison. She was a huge part of our life growing up. Unfortunately, when she got older, she developed a drug problem. Long story short, she is in prison partly for serious crimes committed against me and my wife. It's been very difficult for me to forgive, but my wife's reaction has been more forgiving. That has caused a strain in our marriage. My wife visits regularly. They exchange letters and phone calls. I have not been able to find it in my heart to do the same. However, listening to your podcast has helped thaw my heart a bit. I have begun to ponder about the possibilities of reaching out to her. I am not there yet, but I am closer, thanks to your work. So journalism can change laws and change people. It can close distances. One other thing it did, I think, was help get me out of prison. So you're each gonna play a big role in making this world a better place in closing distances between people. It's a huge responsibility. I have no doubt that you're up to the challenge and I hope my story might inspire you when things get hard. Thank you again for inviting me and con fucking congratulations. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm We're all crying. 
I'm yeah. reminded of the words of Rick to Captain Renault at the end of Casablanca when he says, I hope this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Pedro Cota with the class gift. Hello, everyone. Um, well, first off, I want to start by thanking Erlon Woods. I don't think any of us could have ever asked for a better commencement speaker. And um, so thank you so much, Erlon. We really appreciate your, your very inspiring and kind words. Thanks. So, yes, thank you. Okay, so to all, uh, to all of you watching, my name is Pedro and uh, I'm a class of 2020 documentary track. And each year it's customary for uh, the graduating class to leave a gift for future generations at the J School. And so today I'm here to present our class of 2020 gift. Um, so I was put in charge of this process and started a conversation with my colleagues and we had this long and arduous debate on Slack about what, what we can give to future generations. And we ended up asking ourselves, what is it that the school really needs? What, how can we intellectually feed the next generation <laughs> of this prestigious school? And so the answer was quite clear to us. Forks. There's no <laughs> forks. Woo! J school, how long yeah. the J school has lived without forks in the kitchen? This problem has even been covered by our colleague Max Brimelow in one of his reports that he shared with the, with the school. And we still don't know who the fork bandit is. Um, so <laughs> that's just one of the gifts. This is one of many. And, you know, I'm not trying to throw any shade at the school for not having any forks, but. Um, <laughs> but as you'll see from our next gift, we kind of are trying to, sh to throw some shade here. I just need to change my background so you can sort of catch a little preview of what that would look like. So bear with me. So here's our beautiful courtyard that we have in the J School where a lot of us share our lunches and where a lot of forks might get stolen or lost. But now we're going to have a new addition. And this is that addition. I just need to move out of the way. <laughs> this is just like a Photoshop rendering of our gift. We are getting two offset umbrellas for the courtyard because there's no shade at the courtyard except for the trees we have there. And so future generations will be able to enjoy some shade at the courtyard and not get sunburned. Um, each of these uh, umbrellas will have a little plaque saying class of 2020 on it. And don't worry, we'll make sure to get proper chains and locks so they're not stolen. <laughs> and um, so yeah, that's, that's another gift. But we, we also understand that because of the virus, these are trying times, especially financially for a lot of us. And so keeping that in mind, the, the last gift that we're going to make um, is we're going to make a donation to the Janice Clementine Douglas Emergency Grant Fund. So this is a fund to provide emergency grants for students who are having a tough time financially. And so um, this grant is, um, is a $500 grant for students who apply for this and, um, and are kind of struggling because the Bay Area is, is not... Um, a, a cheap place to live, as we all know. And so um, with that, you know, we are presenting this, this set of gifts to the school. And, um, and so we are, we're very thankful for the school and we hope that uh, future generations enjoy them. Thank you very much. Pedro! I think it's my turn now. I am Mickey Capper. I'm in class of 2020. And let's me just sort of adjust my background here. Um, I, so uh, this year marks the last year at the J School of a teacher, mentor, J School alum, all around life coach and friend, Kara Platoni, also lovingly known as KP. 
As many of you are likely aware, getting a class of 18 sleep deprived, distracted grad students to pay attention to anything for three hours is no small feat. But KP kept us riveted with style and substance. KP led each class with the enthusiasm and energy of someone showing up for their first day of grad school. She'd run lightning round grammar reform school sessions. That's where, where we have um, this um, graphic. <laughs> uh, to hammer home the importance of carefully placed commas and clearly ordered clauses. Her lesson plans would include the perfect example to teach us how to make a story work, even when you can't interview your central source or how to help a reader understand what's really going on at the school board meeting. KP also made being a nerd cool. She told us with wide eyes about covering science and technology, including that one time she fell into a pit in virtual reality. She'd spend endless hours line editing her text and audio from her famous couch. She was showing us it's okay to be really, really excited by the work that you do. Alum Shana Shealy remembers that KP once wore the same color scheme for an entire semester just to see if students could guess the pun that she was dressed as, which was black, white, and red all over. She was dressed as a newspaper and uh, the students didn't catch on <laughs> until uh, the end of the semester. Um, <laughs> there, there's, there's a maxim in journalism that the best way to learn is by doing. And to a certain extent, that's true. Uh, the best way to get started interviewing is to do some interviews. The best way to start writing is to have to file for a deadline. But KP did more than just assign us stories. With infinite patience and care, she would take time with each mistake. She'd help fix the broken sentence or identify the reporting hole, but she would also emphasize the bigger principle to take away from each correction. And all those patient teaching edits weren't just for homework assignments, they were for published stories. In her time here, KP ran a small local media empire. For years, she served as Oakland North's editor-in-chief, steadfastly walking class after class of first semester grad students through the process of reporting on the vast, complex city of Oakland. She pushed us to find original stories and edited us at a steady, at a steady clip, publishing two stories a day, um, which is a pipeline that we've seen the New York Times cannot keep up with. Um, she even worked with students to launch a podcast for the community sites um, and uh, to go through a quick Rashomon um, and uh, of some of our Oakland North classmates and uh, tribute to a K KP some more. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Amy Mustafa. Wyatt Kruf wrote, being guided by KP in Oakland North was the most essential and important part of my journalism education at Berkeley. She taught me how to build sources, how to find stories, how to cover school board meetings, basically all the skills that go into actual reporting. And as I've tried my hand out larger long form stories since Oakland North, it's always those core skills that I need that I'm always tapping into. KP gave me that foundation. Brian Perlman writes, I will always remember KP's sage advice for protests. Don't get caught in the kettle. And Katie Roosh wrote about filing her first 800 word story to Oakland North, so stressed that she was nearly in tears only to get a reassuring response from her first print editor. She said, KP made the self-conscious writer feel like she could do this thing she desperately wanted to do. I needed a kind critic for my fragile ego. Thank goodness this world sent me and all of us, KP. And Ricky Rodas sent this recording and we couldn't deprive you of hearing Ricky in his own words. You know, besides her helping me be the journalist I am today, she's just good people. You know, you don't meet people like that too often, and you just gotta cherish them while you while you got them in your in your life. So I always cherish the memories with KP, and I love you. God bless you. J two hundred with KP may have lasted a semester, but the genuine care she fostered among her Oakland North crew, like you just heard, continued for many. We'd still stay up late working in the cave, still get all the press releases for the city of Oakland, and still find ourselves saying out loud to no one in particular that we're on it. KP has fostered a sense of community across J school generations, hosting Coffee Fridays where students can learn from the alumni who covered their same beat years ago, and maybe ask them for a job today. I will never forget calling KP a week before starting my first semester at the J School, overwhelmed about what I could possibly do to prepare for the coming two years of my life. After going through a brief checklist with me, KP said, 
Sometimes the only things left to do before a big endeavor like this are the simple things. Do the laundry and go grocery shopping. That's exactly what I did. And that support remained constant for myself and so many other students throughout our two years, whether or not we were enrolled in KP's classes. Alum Akira Olivia Komomoto said of KP, she helped me figure out all of my future moves when I spiraled into imposter syndrome. Without Kara, I, and many other students, may not have found the strength and willingness to finish the two-year program. I can say the same myself. Akira went on to say, the journalism industry is better because of Kara. The J School would not be the same without the Platoni Sparkle. The J School won't be the same without the Platoni Sparkle. But as KP takes her editing talents and that sparkle to Wired Magazine, we feel heartened to know she will never really leave the J School community. KP, to thank you, we wanted to get something that reflected not just our appreciation of you, but also the class before us and the classes before them. Years ago, students got KP a cake with her picture on it. They took a picture of her holding the cake, and then the next year, students gave her a cake with that picture of KP holding a cake with another picture of KP. And year after year, what became known as Cakeception has gotten deeper and deeper. KP, as your parting gift, we've ordered you coffee and a mug customized with a picture of you holding a cake inside another picture of you holding a cake inside another picture of you holding a cake, and so on and so on. Generations of students who love and appreciate you all the way down. And now to address you herself, here is KP. You guys, thank you so much. I'm <laughs> crying. Um, thank you, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you, everybody. I love you so much. And um, I just wanted to take one one minute to say just a really last short thing. Um, so, hello to my J friends from a distance. Um, I might have been your teacher for a few classes, and it might have been your first one, and it might have been your last one. So the first one we called J200, and it teaches the basics of reporting. And on the first day of that class, I teach my students the three things that my J200 teacher, the great Cynthia Gorney, taught me. And they are so important that we actually put them on our crest, the Oakland North crest, which is uh, the crest of the website that we ran together for 10 years covering Oakland. And those things are tell the truth and shed light and don't be a jerk. And uh, there's more after that, but it's mostly technique. It all comes back to those three. Uh, tell the truth, shed light, and don't be a jerk. Two years later, some of you joined me to talk about the craft of storytelling in a class that we call Story Structures. And uh, as you all know, I have a lot of thoughts about story structures, but there are just two things that I wanted to remind you of today. And the first is that every TikTok ends with another TikTok, uh, which is to say when one countdown ends, another begins, every cycle, is the beginning of another cycle. The kicker reflects the lead and the lead reflects the kicker. The resolution is that there is no resolution. The end is the beginning and the end is the beginning and the end is the beginning. And the second thing I stole from the playwright Tom Stoppard and it said every exit is an entrance somewhere else. So that's it friends. Tell the truth, shed light, don't be a jerk. Today we celebrate the end of one cycle and the beginning of the next. We exit here so that we can enter somewhere else. I can't wait to see where you go next. Please come back and tell me all about it. Congratulations and thank you all for everything. Love you, KP. Love you. Thank you. First of all, to the um, beautiful, brilliant, courageous, impatient, impossible, and totally hilarious class of 2020. It has been such an honor watching the way you all rose to the insane challenges brought on by this terrifying pandemic. And second of all, I wanna thank this class, not just for your patience with a rookie professor stumbling this through this whole teaching business for the first time, but more importantly, for all of the work and effort 
you put into making the investigative reporting program a better place. You courageously and unsparingly pointed out how the IRP could improve. And you did this through the power of great reporting and clear writing. You spoke truth to power. And we are the better for it. And so thank you. And please know that your work was, in fact, one of the things that most attracted me to this job. I don't think I would be here without it. In 2007, in response to cutbacks at major news operations, the investigative reporting program established the first postgraduate fellowships in investigative reporting in the entire nation. It's designed to enable journalists to tell complex stories in the public interest. In this year, we've been blessed to host three gifted filmmakers who have used their fellowships to do just that. And I'd like to introduce each of them to you to celebrate their contributions to Berkeley journalism. I'll start with Rachel Witte. Rachel is working on a film about how a bungled investigation into a pair of serial killers added immensely to the torment of dozens of families who believe their loved ones were victims. It has been such a pleasure watching Rachel peel back the layers of this story with immense sensitivity to the victims' families and a dogged determination to get to the truth. Second, let me introduce you to Lucas Gilkey. Lucas is working on a film about the use and misuse of solitary confinement in the California prison system. He is a reporter who brings bottomless empathy and curiosity into all of his work. And these are the traits that have allowed him to gain the trust of men who have absolutely no reason to trust a journalist. Thank you, Lucas. And finally, I'd like to introduce you to Jamika Autry. Jamika is working on a multimedia project about Billie Holiday, the great American jazz singer, and the links between her tragic story and the birth of the war on drugs. And I think the best way to describe the power of Jamika's reporting is to tell you that the last time she updated me on what she'd been learning about Billie Holiday, Jamika brought me to tears. I think she also was crying as well as she walked through what she had learned about this life. And so thank you. Thank you so much, Jamika. And I cannot wait to see the stories that Jamika, Lucas, and Rachel ultimately tell based on their year at the IRP. But I would also like to thank them for their commitment to teaching and mentoring students especially over the course of the last two months, when all three of them set aside their projects to lead teams of students covering the pandemic. And that is not what they signed up for when they accepted their fellowships. And yet all three have worked extremely hard to help students, to help you guys meet this moment. So thank you to our fellows and thank you to the class of 2020. Thank you, David, and shout out the class of 2020. Wissam Al Badri. Somebody has to come up. Woo! 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 Aksuleal John. Woo! Woo! Nisha Balaram. Woo! 
Aaron Banks Rusby. <laughs> Annie Berman. <laughs> Edward Booth. <laughs> Max Brimelo. Go, Max! <laughs> Eating it again. Your background, okay? Nikki Capper. <laughs> <laughs> Annette Unchoy. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll just cheer tonight with this. Christian Lee Collins. <laughs> Jennifer Cortez Delgado. <laughs> Pedro Alberto Cota. <laughs> Ali DeFazio. Laurence Dussault. Angelica Keke. Molly Forster. Vishaka Gupta. Barbara Ann Perry Harvey. Alexa Hornback. Mara Cardis Nelson. Mickey Tony. Ravlin Carr. Ryan Rose Kelly. <laughs> Quiet proof. Yeah. Shuan Lee. Love you, Shuan. <laughs> Ashvini Malshi. Ashvini! Go! Betty Marquez Rosales. <laughs> Alex Leeds Matthews. A la, uh, Amy Mustafa. Rachel Lauren Mueller. Let's go, Rach. Get it, girl. Eric Murphy. Nushan Nadarazad. <laughs> Ashley Omoma. Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> <Blue> Orozco. <laughs> yeah. 
Tessa Paoli. Gisela Nick Roberts. <laughs> Ricky Rodas. Ricky, Ricky, Ricky. Katie Roach. Katie. Darren Ciano Jr. DJ. DJ. DJ, 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 DJ. Yes, Tito. Meg Schutzer. Let's go, Meg. Casey Ann Smith. Nina Sparley. Nina, 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 Nina. Love you, Nina. Love you, baby. Love you. Allison Meager Stamos. Allison. 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 James Tenswall. Jimmy. 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 Sarah Trent. Rosa Amanda Turiran. Rosa! Christy Warren. <laughs> Carla Williams. I love you. May Ying Wu. And Brendan Medigati Moreno. Congratulations to the class of 2020. Well, yeah. So, with thanks to our brilliant cast of speakers today, it is my honor and privilege to present to you. UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism, Class of 2020.